Today we'll be covering all the latest events surrounding Starship and its development, and also the lawyer wife will be making her grand appearance. Then we'll take a look at a draft environmental assessment SpaceX submitted to the FAA, as well as Crew Dragon and Starlink. We'll look at some dates for some upcoming SpaceX launches, then finish up by doing the honorable thing with this week's honorable mention. This is a lengthier episode, so I hope I can fill all those big falcon holes in your life. I'm the Kevmeister, and this is SpaceX in the News. So last week we left off with the stacking of SN1's methane tank. But on the following day, Boca Chica crews continue to stack as they place the methane tank on top of the lower locks tank. Lab Padre's live stream managed to capture a time lapse of the event, and soon after, the workers performed what appeared to be a fit check for a methane downcomer, before removing the pipe entirely. Then during the wee hours of a foggy Tuesday morning, sneaky SpaceX transported the fully stacked propellant portion of SN1 down to the launch site where they placed it upon its test mount. But they couldn't hide it from South Padre, who was on site to capture the arrival. By the time this happened, nobody in the community knew what kind of test was going to be performed. But in comes Elon to the rescue with some banging news. SpaceX is going to strap Raptor to it and light her up. How many Raptor engines? We just don't know at this time. But what we do know is that SN2 will have three, which by the way, is already well under construction. Tank integration has begun and a new nose cone is being stacked but that nose cone could be for either SN1 or SN2. We just don't know at this time. But here's the thing. It turns out SpaceX wasn't using the right settings for their welding machines when building SN1. So I think it's safe to say that if SN1 only receives one Raptor engine for the static fire, it's very likely SN2 will be the Starship to make the 20-click flight with its three Raptors. But who knows, maybe Elon is waiting for the results of this static fire before making a decision. And it could take place during the scheduled road closure Saturday morning which is just hours away from now and subject to change. SpaceX tweeted out their third Raptor test stand has been activated. Last year, we mentioned an old tripod test stand was being renovated in McGregor, Texas by SpaceX for Raptor testing. And now they can test fire Raptor in a vertical configuration, which should allow SpaceX to simplify some aspects of the engine design. Last week, we spoke about the LA Board of Harbor Commissioners approval of SpaceX's permit to move back to the port of LA. Well, on Tuesday, SpaceX was given final approval from the city council to officially move back in. I've got a lovely new contact down there in SoCal who is willing to help keep an eye on the situation. You can keep an eye on his YouTube content via link in the description. Thanks, midlife Chrisis. Okay, now it's time once again to check in on the situation that's developing down there in Boca Chica, Texas between SpaceX and the residents. Last week, Business Insider released an article that quite frankly didn't make SpaceX look too good. So I begged my lawyer wife to come back on the show and explain the whole situation to us. Because let's face it, you've got to give the audience what they want and you guys made it quite clear, your team carry. So without any further ado, please give a cold welcome to someone very critical. I mean, very critical to my success. Attorney, friend, breadwinner, love of my two fur children, valedictorian of capital law, and relentless cutthroat in the energy and utility sector. My lawyer wife, carries. It's been months since you last saw her, but now she's back and she's pissed off at me. It's the return of the lawyer wife. So the big issue was Business Insider came out with an article last week citing um, a now removed job posting for a project coordinator position with SpaceX. And there's one line in the job posting that references a SpaceX village. And that has apparently upset some residents who have sold their property because now they're under the impression that they were um, lied to about selling their property because they think that this SpaceX village is some sort of like private resort that Elon is going to build. And they're upset that they sold their property and then this came out after they had already sold their property. The, one of the responsibilities as the project coordinator is to make Boca Chica an epic place to live and work, coordinate all village bookings, and develop an automated booking system. Current goal is to have 100 rooms. And then a little bit farther down it says you're also supposed to plan and create new activities. Example, rock wall, kayaking, volleyball tournaments. And a little farther down it says you are also to manage, coordinate, and act as a liaison to facilities, construction projects, and maintenance operations for the SpaceX Village. So that's the only part that references the SpaceX Village in the entire project coordinator job posting. Somehow this Business Insider 
releases an article with the title, Elon Musk wants to build a private SpaceX village with 100 rooms, lounge parties, volleyball tournaments, and rock climbing amid a South Texas retiree community. What I don't like about the title of this Business Insider article, beyond the fact that you can't actually read the article unless you pay for it, is written as fact, as if this is exactly what Elon's doing, and it's not even clear in that job position. Like, you know, it's, it's open to speculation and open to interpretation what that project coordinator position is to begin with. If you read through the whole job article, it's actually more about like coordinating and like logistics and not, not necessarily event planning. The workers are gonna be working hard, but don't you think they're gonna need some sort of like activities or like stress relief on the weekends or maybe when they're not working during their downtime? So it would make sense that you'd wanna keep your workers happy. Why would you be posting all these other job positions for, you know, phase X, phase X, phase X, like, you know, engineer, mechanic, you know, all these other things, a cook, you know, things that you would need, amenities that you would need to even create and build this entire SpaceX facility, but then you're going to also post this random hospitality job for a resort? It makes no sense. I mean, it makes no sense. If, if you look at the job posting, you also are supposed to report system repairs of HVAC equipment, electrical systems, fire protection, water and plumbing infrastructure, paint and groundskeeping. That doesn't sound like a hospitality type position to me. It sounds like you are going to be the person who comes in and helps you know, create the electronic booking system to help coordinate all the temporary workers that are gonna be coming in to you know, the facility because if you look on SpaceX's website, they do have a lot of temporary job postings right now, which makes sense because they're going to phase in their workers. So what I think this project coordinator position is, you are essentially overseeing all the travel type stuff of, of the workers coming in and making sure that everybody's got a place to stay. Because you have to remember, there's nothing out there. I mean, there's absolutely nothing out there. So it would make perfect sense that you need to hire somebody to take this off your plate and, and handle all this. So I think it's just a misconception that this one article that is protected by a paywall has created this SpaceX Village controversy, which is just not there. I, I feel like it was kind of like a hit job almost on Elon Musk, the way that the title was written as if it were fact. And then you can't read the article because there's a paywall. It's almost hearsay within hearsay, within hearsay, which is like the worst possible uh, way to, you know, prove your evidence or support your position. When you actually read the whole article, it says the listing doesn't specify whether all 100 rooms will be for workers or whether all of them are designed to be temporary. But Google and Facebook have constructed similar housing communities for that purpose. I was looking up his, the FAA filing from 2014 because long story short, when you're going to build something massive like this, one of many things the federal government needs to approve is the impact on like environmental or the environmental impact and you know wildlife wildlife species all that kind of stuff and in that filing from 2014 i believe it was they actually briefly talk about the construction of the spacex facility in boca chica there's one reference to they're expecting to have a hundred employees on site working at any given time by 2025. So I'm like, huh, 100 employees. That matches right up with the 100 rooms. So I just thought, mm, coincidence. I think SpaceX actually has treated people fairly well. And, and to be honest, there's a couple um, forums that you can find. And there's actually residents posting on some of these forums. And even a couple of them have said, I was treated very well. Um, a top SpaceX guy came out and, you know, made sure that everything went through okay and came in and checked on me. Like, I, I think SpaceX has gone about this in the best way possible. SpaceX is giving, you know, private event tickets for launches to those who sold, like they're essentially like VIP passes, if you will. Which again, if the negotiations went poorly, I don't think that would be something that SpaceX would include in the deal. I think those residents also need to realize that what you think your property is worth and what it actually is gonna be worth in a negotiation or a sale are two completely different things. And that's gonna be true anywhere. Anybody's gonna think their property's worth more than what it is because there's an emotional connection to it. You can see what the tax assessment is for the land and it's not a lot. So I think some people might have been unrealistic in starting incredibly high thinking they were gonna get this amount of money. I can't think that 
the negotiations were tense or in bad faith uh, at all because if you look on Cameron County's website, there's so many warranty deeds that have gone through. And, and if you look on the property map, you can see the parcel numbers and they're getting switched over to, to SpaceX owning them now. People would not sell if they felt they were being treated unfairly. You have every right to stay there and you know it's your property. You can stay there, but you will lose an eminent domain case. Before they can exercise eminent domain, the spaceport has to obtain a resolution that will approve the proposed condemnation of the property. And they have to get it from the governing body of a county in which the property is located. So in non-legal terms, what that means is essentially the Texas legislator has um, granted its right, its, its powers to exercise eminent domain to the Spaceport Development Corp. Not SpaceX, but the court itself. So now that they have that power, the only thing that they have to do before they can exercise it is to get Cameron County to pass a resolution saying, okay, it's fine, you can condemn this property. And then they will acquire title in it. All right, hopefully you got your fill of the lawyer wife now so you can leave me alone about it. This month, SpaceX sent in their draft environmental assessment form to the FAA for the purpose of modifying and expanding several elements of its Falcon launch vehicle program at KSC so they can increase the operational capabilities and cost effectiveness of their flight programs. In the draft, SpaceX proposes building a new 284 foot tall mobile service tower at pad 39A for their Falcon rockets. And as a bonus, you can see here a rendering of a larger fairing that's stacked upon a Falcon Heavy. You never know, it could be a hint for what the future holds for the heavy rocket. But anyway, this proposal is 121 pages long, so if you'd like to check it out, I'll leave a link in the description. Demo 2 is no longer going to be just a couple week mission to the International Space Station. NASA knots Bob and Doug were photographed in the dunk tank training for a spacewalk that will be performed during their stay on the ISS, which means Demo 2 could easily be a month long mission now. It would give a chance for the Crew Dragon capsule to be exposed to more time in the vacuum of space before making its return to Earth. And this week, SpaceX was also hiring for a new aeronautical terminal certification manager position. This means the company is already planning to integrate Starlink with airliners. So the next time you fly commercially and want that $5 Wi-Fi that just never works half the time because everyone on the plane is trying to watch the free movie, tell your flight attendant to start looking into using Starlink services now. Well, not now, but later. Apparently, it will be fast enough to allow every passenger to game online. This Starlink technology is already being tested with Space Force and other branches of the U.S. military. In fact, on April 8th, they're going to use Starlink to shoot down a drone during a massive test that will include ground forces, submarines, ships, and a variety of space-based assets. The next SpaceX Starlink launch is scheduled for March 11th, but the next SpaceX launch is CRS-20, now scheduled for March 6th. Now it's time to head over to today's honorable mention. Today's honorable mention is truly meant to honor someone that we lost this past week. And yes, while we did lose a nationally beloved hidden figure, Katherine Johnson, I'm going to focus on a much lesser known and still to this day, a misunderstood individual. So in my honorable mention intro, did you ever catch this clip right here and ask yourself, what is that? Maybe you already knew, but for those of you who don't know, that is part of a video taken of Daredevil Mike Hughes, known as Mad Mike Hughes, launching himself for a second time in his homemade steam-powered rocket. I personally have always respected the guy, but not everybody in the space community feels the same way. Why? Because supposedly he was a flat earther. Now I should probably be clear about this. I'm not a flat earther, but I've been blessed with the amazing superpower to be able to look past someone's personal beliefs and to what they really are, a human being. Mad Mike was a 64-year-old limousine driver and daredevil from Apple Valley, California. And he first came into the national spotlight in 2014 when he launched himself in a model rocket. That's when I first came across his existence and immediately I thought the guy had gigantic melons in his pants. And yes, that he was crazy as well. But the fact of the matter is, daredevils just don't think the same way us normies do. While the average person would turn and run if asked to do a stunt with a 50-50 chance of survival, Daredevils are happy to throw down on black. But even though Mike liked to gamble with his life, the risks were always calculated. Before his first launch, Mike reached out to a lifetime rocket enthusiast, Waldo Stakes, a guy who knows his stuff when it comes to steam rockets. And when Mike asked Waldo what he thought of his homemade rocket, Waldo responded, I think you're going to kill yourself. So Mike asked Waldo if he would help him make his rocket so it wouldn't kill him, and Waldo agreed. 
and because of Watto's help, Mike was able to engineer himself a less deadly steam rocket and survived his 2014 maiden flight, but it wasn't without a price. Just before Mike entered his rocket, he heard a noise, a pin leak, which is a malfunction that happens before the rocket goes boom and kills everything in the blast zone. But instead of scrubbing and running, Mike yells for everyone to move away. He puts his helmet on, quickly straps himself into the rocket the best he can, and launches the sucker. But his ground speed was so fast that when he deploys his chute, the force just shreds it. And he doesn't have a backup because he disconnected it before he launched. I guess he doesn't trust using multiple chutes because he thinks they'll get tangled. But anyway, there was enough chute there to keep him from dying, so he hit the ground at 60 miles per hour instead of at terminal velocity hurting his back and those big melons of his. Now, this is very important. At the time of the launch, Mike was not vocal about the shape of the Earth. Notice how he has no flat Earth decals on his rocket. And that's because, in his own words, Mike's journey was never about proving the Earth was flat. It was always about Mike being a daredevil and his wish to go to space. He also wanted to inspire people. Does that sound familiar? Before this flight, Mike was only able to bring in $310 in sponsorships. But after the flight, Mike discovered a way to finance his rocket by exploiting his fellow flat earthers. And thus, his rush to the headlines as a Darwin award-winning flat earther reached its apogee. And for a second launch, Mike was able to pull in $7,875 in support. So really, if anything, he's kind of a marketing genius. So in 2018, Mike launched himself again, and this time successfully with no major issues. A documentary was filmed about the launch called Rocket Man, and it was released on Amazon Prime in 2019. It shares some pretty insightful glimpses into the person Mike really was. Yes, he was a conspiracy theorist, borderline sovereign citizen, and flat earther. But Darren Schuster, Mike's PR representative, has claimed that Mike never actually believed in the flat earth. They simply used the notion to keep publicity going. So Mike may have been some of those things that he was called over the years, but he was also misunderstood, estranged from his wife and children and alone, and allegedly abused by his dad as a kid. He was an animal lover, especially of cats, and had a good sense of humor. He, like all of us, was also a dreamer. He wanted to go to space, but Mike was also a doer. He wasn't willing to wait for someone else to take him there. It would have cost Mad Mike $2 million to reach space the way he wanted to, so to fund his venture even further, he decided to do another rocket stunt for a Science Channel television show called Homemade Astronauts. And so on Saturday, February 22nd, 2019, Mike attempted his third launch in a homemade steam rocket, but unfortunately, this is where his journey to the stars ended. No official cause for this unfortunate event has been released at this time, but by taking a closer look at the video, we can see Waldo still retreating from the rocket's blast zone when Mike hits it. This is a lot sooner than Mike's previous launch and leads me to ponder if the rocket launched unexpectedly. Maybe when Mike was releasing the pre-valves or something. But as the vehicle ascends the launch stand, the parachute is ripped from its container. But this still begs the question, what happened to the second parachute? Did Mike disconnect it again over his distrust of using two chutes? I doubt it. Mike deployed the second chute during his previous launch. So did his team simply forget to arm it, or was it pilot error? For whatever reason, Mike never deploys a second parachute, and his story comes to an end. Sadly, both before and after Mike's death, many people across social media were quick to call him names and belittle his character. All because he became a face to the Flat Earth movement. But Mad Mike wasn't a Flat Earther. He was a daredevil a daredevil with the dream to go to space on his own merit. So I hope we can all come together to remember Mike Hughes for who he was and not what we think he was. But that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you eccentric patrons and members for your continuous support of my channel. It's because of those guys I have the time to put these episodes together for all of you. So if you too would like to show your support, there's a link in the description below. You all have a wonderful weekend and until I see you in the next one, Godspeed.